Welcome to Box Church. We are so glad you have joined us. We want you to participate in this time gathered with your box. We want you to crank up the volume and sing with all your might. Clap, be intimate with the Lord. Be excited about praising Him. Let Him be your audience as you worship. If you wanna go off to a quiet place and lay face down before the Lord, you do that. This is a time in which we want you to encounter Jesus in a real way in the safety of real community. After the message is over, there will be some discussion questions for you to talk about. Be open and transparent during that time. You never know how your story and your struggles may help someone sitting right around you. And as you gather together in your box, know that you are joining with people in other parts of the world, worshiping in this exact same way. So what are you waiting for? Let's stand to our feet and get excited about worshiping our risen Savior. Desire is now satisfied. 
building tonight, right? No guilt, no shame, no sin, no stain is greater than the great I am. No fear, no grave, no other name is greater than the great I am. No guilt, no shame, no sin, no false it out.
Yes, Jesus center of it all. Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Amen. Amen. You know, scripture says in John 15, 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We are to have that center focus of Jesus Christ in our life as the vine. And we are those branches that shoot off from that. Having Christ as our focus, Christ as our center, is going to allow us as Christians to bear fruit for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for being the center of our lives. Thank you for being the vine. Thank you for being there for us, providing for us, Lord, and caring for us. We praise you and we honor you. In your holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
I will never forget a conversation I had on an airplane flying from the U.S. to Africa. Seated right next to me was a woman who had her master's degree in theology from seminary, but who no longer believed in the existence of God. Well, logically, I started saying, well, what about this or, or what about that? And finally, at some point in the conversation, the Holy Spirit prompted me to say these words to her. What happened in your life that made you walk away from God? Tears started to well up in her eyes. And this is what she said. I asked God for something and he didn't come through. I concluded that he must no longer exist. She had opened up her heart, but before I could pry any deeper, she said these words to me, and don't talk to me about surrender. Wow. When we don't agree with the one who calls the shots, our reaction is often the same. Maybe God, you're not the right one for the job. And I'm sure we've all been there at some point in our Christian lives, feeling the same way when God's ways don't seem to make sense. I often think back to John the Baptist sitting in a prison cell saying these words, are you the Christ or should we be looking for someone else? Whoa, did he really say that? No, 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 God. You don't do it this way. Uh, obedient living results in health and wealth and safety and everything working out right. Isn't that right? Listen, it's in those moments that we trust God or we don't. That we surrender to his plan and lay ours down. And it's a point of entry that God requires everyone to succumb to. There is no salvation without surrender. There is no God encounter without surrender to him first. And even in your Christian walk with the Lord, he continues to ask you to surrender to his ways and his lordship. This is because he is attached to it and God will not move in your life until you walk through the door of surrender. Just ask Abraham. Remember him? His story is found in Genesis chapter 12. Let's begin reading in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. So, he is 75 when God calls out to him, and he is 100 years old when this promise is finally realized. Genesis 21, verse 1. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant. She gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. For 25 years, Abraham and Sarah waited for the promise of God to come to fruition. That's a long time of waiting. And by the way, let me tell you, one of the hardest things you will ever have to do in your Christian life is wait on God. All right, but the promise for them is finally realized. And they're overjoyed. And for about 15 years or so, everything is great. Abraham is watching his promised son grow up. 
And Abraham is envisioning the future for his son, waiting for him to get married. Abraham is finally at peace with God. He's no longer waiting for the promise, and he has received the promise, and he gets to hug his promised son every night. Isn't God good? And then we get to one of the most tension-filled passages in all of the Bible, Genesis 22. It says sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called, yes, he replied, here I am. Notice the word tested. Right off the bat, we know that God is up to something. And the severity of the request that you are about to read has to be seen through this lens. This is a test from Almighty God. Verse 2, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Okay, this was the test. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering to me. Well, let me briefly explain child sacrifice. It's, it's something that God never condoned. The Old Testament explicitly forbids it. And God judged all the nations and brought disaster on any nation who practiced it. And he called those children sacrificed my children because God loves children. So why does he call Abraham to do this? He is testing his faith. Is Abraham willing to offer God that which is most precious to him? But you say, well, Pastor Matt, this was God's promise to Abraham. This is the fulfillment of God's dream in his life. Why would God ask him for this? Listen very closely. It's what God asks every one of us as well because he's attached to surrender. What do you do with the promise when it finally turns into a reality? When you finally get married, uh, when you finally have children, when you finally get the dream job that you've been praying for, when you finally start dating the girl that you've always dreamed about dating, when your career finally takes off, when you finally get your dream home, Let's rephrase God's request to Abraham. Take your dream, your only dream. Yes, that dream, the one that I gave you that you love so much, go and sacrifice that dream as a burnt offering to me. Here's the question. What do you do when the promise is finally realized? you give the dream back to God. Understand this about God. He's attached to surrender. And when God gives you your dream, he is going to ask for it back. He's going to ask you to surrender that dream to him. He's going to ask you to entrust that dream over to his care. He's going to ask you to allow him to determine the outcome of the dream. Why? Because it's his dream for you. It's not your dream. There is never a moment in our lives where we have permission to be unsurrendered to God in any area. Let me repeat that. There is never a moment in our lives where we have permission to be unsurrendered to God in any area. God requires surrender because he's attached to it. When a dream remains unsurrendered to God, something happens. The dream that is realized often turns into the idol that we worship. The God-given dream oftentimes replaces God. And most of the time, the consequences are unintended. 
Uh, think about moms and children for one second. Moms typically love their children. And the problem becomes when they hold them so tightly that they unintentionally squeeze God out of it. You ever seen those parents? I will protect him. I'm not going to let her out of my sight. Think about marriages for one second. <laughs> I got him. It's my job to keep him. Or I'm going to control her so that she does what I want. Think about finances. I make this money. I can do with it what I want. Uh, think about the dream job. Hey, I got myself here. It's my job to keep myself here. And we squeeze and we squeeze and we own it and we possess it until we finally begin to ultimately worship it. It's something that God never intended. And God wanted Abraham to worship the God of the dream, not the dream itself. So he asked for it back. And I promise you, listen to me, he will ask for your dream back as well. Phil Vischer, the founder of VeggieTales, eventually lost everything he had worked so hard for. His dream was taken away, and here's what he said about it. God showed me that the work I was doing for him had become greater than my relationship with him. <laughs> the dream when not given back ultimately becomes your God. And this is why the dream must have an altercation. <laughs> it must be laid on the altar. Here's what Watchman Nee says. We approach God like little children with open hands begging for gifts. Because God is a good God, He fills our hands with good things like life and health and friends, wealth, success, good kids, a good home, a good marriage. We rejoice in what we have received and we run around comparing what we have with, other, with what others have. But at some point, when our hands are finally full, God says, my child, I long to have fellowship with you. Reach out your hand and take my hand. But we can't <laughs> because our hands are full. And God says, put those things aside and take my hand. And we cry, no, no, we can't. It's too hard to put them down. And God says, but I'm the one who gave them to you in the first place. Oh God, what you have asked for is too hard. Please don't ask us to put those things aside. And God answers quietly. You must. You must. When my children were little and still sleeping in a crib, I would do this with them virtually every single night. I would take them in my arms and I would lift them up over the crib and place them down in it. And by doing that natural motion, it mimics the same motion as an offering. So I just made my children an offering to God every night. I had an altercation. Lord, they are yours, not mine. In my previous study at my former church, there was a chair in my office. And in that chair, I spent time with God reading my Bible. And one morning in my study, I had an altercation. I emptied everything out of my pockets and I began laying them down in the seat of the chair as I was on my knees in the presence of God. My keys, which represented the home and the vehicles that I owned. I put my wallet in that chair, which represented the credit cards and everything I financially possessed. I took pictures of my children. Lord, you can have my children. A picture of my wife. Lord, you can have my marriage. I put my watch representing my, my time and my schedule. I took my Bible and laid it open and I, it just represented my ministry. And as tears rolled down my face, I laid myself on the altar of God in that moment. Listen. 
God will lead you to an altercation because he is attached to surrender. And he will ask you to lay that dream on the altar. In a recent article from Chip and Joanna Gaines, Chip wrote this about their business. Shortly after opening Magnolia store for the first time, Joanna made a heartbreaking decision to close the successful little shop so that she could spend more time with her family. And just like that, Joanna trusted God's plan and said goodbye to everything she'd worked so hard to build so that she could be at home with her beautiful babies. Joanna shared, I remember the last day. You know, we were closing the shop down and I'm crying because it's the end of a dream. And I feel like I hear God say very, very clearly, Joanna, if you trust me with your dreams, I'm going to take Magnolia further than you could have ever dreamed. So just trust me. And I remember hearing that and feeling completely peaceful about it. And I walked away. Let me ask you, will it be tough to surrender, to let go? Yes. Uh, do you think it was tough for Abraham or Joanna Gaines? Yes. But do you think it will be worth it? Absolutely. Because when God asks for it, you have to understand that he is on the other side of that point of surrender. He's waiting for you. And what is it that is, that's attached to surrender? What is it? What, what's waiting on the other side? Well, let me ask you, what did Abraham experience as a result of giving up his dream, Isaac? Five things. The first one was genuine peace. In this account of Abraham, you don't see Abraham in conflict. Notice what it says in Genesis 22, verse 3. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. And, and he walks up the mountain. He takes the knife and he's ready to do whatever God wants. He's completely surrendered to God in this moment. And how do I know that he's in peace? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Abraham was so assured in the promise of God that even if God let his plan go through, he was convinced that God would raise Isaac back up from the dead. And that's what the altar brings. It is genuine peace where you don't have to worry anymore or try to control and manipulate the circumstances. But it also brings about something else. The second thing is true worship. True worship. Notice Genesis 22, 4 and 5. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey. Abraham told the servants, the boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there and then we will come right back. Well, Abraham viewed the altar as a time of worship. We will worship and then we will come back. Can I tell you something? The altar always leads to worship. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Listen, surrender leads to true and proper worship. And whether it's your dream or yourself, the altar is where true worship takes place. 
You can't worship God without going to the altar of surrender. Well, surrender leads to something else, and that's the third thing, divine encounter. Look at what happens in verses 9 through 12. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. In his moment of surrendering everything to God, fully trusting the Lord and his plan, God showed up. He experienced the manifestation and the presence of God. And if you want to experience the real presence of God in your life, meet the Lord often in the place of surrender because that's where he is and that's where he makes himself known. Well, let me tell you something else that surrender brings you to and that is number four, supernatural provision. Look at verses 13 and 14. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. And to this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Abraham named that very place of surrender, the Lord will provide. And he saw the Lord provide for him in a miraculous way. And that's what the altar of surrender does. Listen, because God is attached to it. God begins to work and do things in your life. And the last thing that Abraham experienced by surrendering was this, number five, full blessing. Look at verses 15 and 18. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. Because you've laid your dream on the altar, Abraham, I'm going to take that dream and I'm going to show you the full extent of it. And as I've said before in this series, obedience always brings God's blessings. And this blessing wasn't just limited to Abraham, but to all the nations of the earth. It was the fullest extent of God's blessings on his life. And I love how the story ends. Look at Genesis 22, verse 19. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. Isn't that great? He just lived. Listen, you will never truly live in peace, in true worship, in the presence of God, with his divine provision and supernatural blessing until you come to the altar of surrender, until you truly trust your dream and yourself into God's total care. Listen, it's the best possible place to live. 
And whatever he's asking for, give it to him. Let him, the good God, who knows what's best for you because he created you, let him take control of it. Live in the land of surrender and begin to truly live. Man, amen. What a great, great word. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this moment. I thank you, God, that you are in the midst of this. And God, that you are giving us the example of Abraham to know that we can trust you fully and completely. Even when our minds, it, it just seems like a crazy thing to do. Oh God, I pray. I pray that we would often go to the altar, having an altercation with you, just laying everything down before you because we trust you fully. God, I truly believe there is nothing that you will not do for a person who is fully surrendered to you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would just choose to let go of those things that are in our hands so that we can take your hand and that you lead us to a place of divine encounter and peace. Lord, a place of absolute surrender where we see you work and move in a mighty way. God, convince us of this. I pray, Lord, that the devil would not sweep in and, and take away this word that has been planted in our hearts. Would you seal it to us and bring it back to us often? Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray, God, that as we spend time in a group together community, Lord, that we would just be transparent and open with one another. And God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I am so glad that you worship Jesus with Box Church. Know that this is just the beginning point for your box for the rest of the week. Again, this is about living in community with one another. So eat together, take the Lord's Supper together, pray together, get to know one another, and enjoy the company of those in your box, and spend time thinking about how you can financially bless the community, the nation, and the world. And when you gather together again, do so in the company of new people that you have brought to the Lord. Continue to be the church and continue to bless the community right where you are.